I consider myself a designer. I, I don't know if I've ever thought of myself really as an artist, although I do kind of think these pieces are really more sculpture than they are a design. But my fascination really lies with, uh, with materials and processes and techniques. And I love the idea of pushing the boundaries of these. There was a really interesting opportunity to create some really large, big, beautiful glass pieces because it really is an incredible material. These pieces are cast and they're cast in an oven so the stuff has to melt in a mould. And that process alone can take up to six months. Colour is always an important thing for me. The colour comes really through the material itself. The colours react in really fundamentally different ways physically. What you see at the beginning is not what you get at the end. So it's all a very kind of esoteric and kind of organic process. There are a number of Cloisonne works in the show. I've been aware of um, Cloisonne as a process since I studied jewellery and silversmithing straight after I finished high school. It's a process that's really fascinated me since then. But I've been looking for an excuse to work with this process ever since. It required trips all over the place, culminating in a number of trips to Beijing, which is where Cloisonne essentially started. Well, one of the greatest challenges was simply the scale of these objects. They initially said that it was impossible and, you know, slowly, slowly we kind of got them around to, to, to understanding how they might consider doing these, these enormously large objects, which are amongst the largest things that have ever been made in Cloisonne. What Cloisonne really is, is about creating small ridges or boundaries with, with little pieces of copper that contain pockets of, of, this, of this enamel. And that's how you can vary colour. We had to create the entire infrastructure to build these things. They, they require a place, a furnace, in which to sort of fire these things, and that certainly didn't exist, so we had to build that as well. It's sort of alchemy, actually, because, you know, the rate of failure is obviously quite high, especially when you're doing really large things. So one of the other objects in the exhibition is a surfboard. For my very first exhibition at Gagosian back in 2007, I had this sort of mad idea to design a surfboard for Garrett McNamara. Garrett surfs big waves. He's utterly fearless and completely mad and it was the first time that anyone had attempted to make a surfboard out of metal. And he used that back in 2007, and then Garrett really became the, the godfather of that sport, I suppose. He went on to discover this wave in Portugal in a place called Nazaré, which is generally regarded as being the biggest wave in the world. And so when the opportunity of having an exhibition again, uh, in that I thought, wouldn't it be fun to do another thing with Garrett, you know, after sort of 10 years. This time, the object is made in, uh, in aluminium. It's actually machined from a solid lump, so we could dial in to a much more accurate degree, not only its weight, its mass, but, but, but the center of gravity and things like that. One of my favorite techniques in the production of glass works is a thing called Marina Technica. And it's a process of creating rods of glass. So you lay them out on a surface, put them in an oven, and they all sort of blend and fuse together. And that's how you get this kind of crazy, sort of organic, very unpredictable pattern. Like the Cloisonne pieces, you know, this is a process that's used to make small decorative objects. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to sort of push the boundaries of that particular process. And I simply set about trying to make the biggest piece of Marina Technica glass that, that we could possibly make. You know, like Cloisonne, it's a, it's a very, very, very old sort of historical process, but you know, that I've tried to sort of recontextualize in a contemporary way. I spent a lot of time in Japan over the years, more than, more than just about anywhere else. And I knew about the Japanese obsession with steel and with blades and with swords and how these, these particular objects hold a place in their, 
in their psyche really. I mean, they're practically sort of spiritual objects. Through many strange twists of fate, I was sort of paired with this sword maker. And we have a, a handful of these swords, which will be almost certainly the last swords that the Japanese sword maker, Hoke Saburo, will ever make. Uh, and he's what is referred to in Japan as a national living treasure. When we talk about a sword, you're talking about a really, you know, like a, like a, a collection of things. And so I was involved in all of the design of all of those things, except the blade, because the blade is the, the bit that he does. As I've learned, it's an incredibly kind of complex and, and on the other hand, incredibly simple object. I mean, the whole thing is literally held together by a little dowel, which just sort of fits into the handle and, and that's how they always were. <laughs> It's not about creating these things so that I can have them. It's, it's, it's about creating these things so, you know, I, at the end of the process, have learned how to do it. So my kind of body of knowledge is, uh, is, is that much greater. So the next time I want to do something, you know, I know just that little bit more.